Ladies and gentlemen, we are live at Myth Vision Podcast, and I'm the host, Derek Lambert. If you're new, tuning in, hit that like button, check out hitting the subscribe button and that bell, because we talk about a lot of different things, especially critical thought, critical scholarship when it comes to biblical studies, and of course, other avenues as well, Islamic, you know, Judaism, you name it, the whole nine. Those are the main three that we discuss, but we also are going to delve into other things. I talk about scientific topics and other things. Today, we're going to have two academics, two PhDs, scholars who are critical, not only critical of biblical studies. One of them is a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. One is a Hebrew Bible, if you will, scholar, and also ancient Near East. So Assyriology and such, Dr. Joshua Bowen. And before we do, I want you guys to see how important this channel really is. I mean, look, you can say, I, I don't think it's that important, but you'd have to dispute it with these guys. <music> We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, I am an ex-Christian, someone who's come out of Christian worldview, and I do a lot of that on this channel. So if you're tuning in and you're a Christian, I highly recommend you take this warning, this cautious uh, warning for me to say to you. The discussions today are critical, I'm sure, but I want you to know that's what my channel does, is take a critical approach. So if you're offended by it, this is not for you. However, today our guest, Dr. Joshua Bowen and Dr. Kip Davis, welcome to Myth Vision. We're going to be talking critical stuff. There's going to be questions. Are you gentlemen ready? I know I'm Dr. Ready. Kip is. I'm so are the dogs, apparently. The dogs are down. No, so yeah. there's been, dude, I'm going to just get out, get out the gate. We've already got a few questions, but there's been some awesome. controversy that has been going on online. Uh it there's wasn't always me. <laughs> there's always an apologist who's pushing away in which uh, they're trying to make the Bible, of course, fit contemporary concepts and what we're looking at today. Oh, no, 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 it's not. There's no intertextuality, for example. We see that uh, <laughs> you guys are going to be doing a response to inspiring philosophy. And, um, you know, the funny thing about the Internet world is, is most of these people that we engage with in real life, if you went down to the bar, let's say, you guys would probably be per perfectly cool. Oh, yeah. There'd be no problem. You'd have a beer, Most hang likely, out. Yeah. Most yeah. likely, yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I want everyone to know they can ask a question. Ask your questions. You don't have to super chat. I'm saying super chat skip the damn line, though. So if you want to mm -hmm. have your question, go to the tippy tippy. Helps keep the lights on. Helps us keep doing what we're doing. But I'm going to ask questions to both of these scholars. If you have a critical question, you want to challenge them, feel free. We're probably going to open up the uh, room for one at a time questions from the audience. We'll see. We'll see how things go. Yeah, and I don't. I mean, I know it's debated, but I think um, certain interpretations of Hezekiah nine nine say that the Lord calls you to super chat. So that's biblical. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I saw St. write a blog post about Hezekiah 9-9. Wow. Well, it shows up in the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. so that's that's why Dr. Kip knows about it. Yeah. It, yes, yeah. it does. Sorry, That guys, makes perfect my, sense. Yeah, I was wondering what this. happened. Whoops. It <laughs> it's, that, uh, it's that $24 I, camera. <laughs> it's, hey, man. That's, that's privileged information. I apologize. I apologize. It is. It is. I need, it's not I've, anymore. I've got a, Damn it. I've got a reputation to keep up here. 
I apologize oh, profusely. So, all right, let's let's start chipping away at some of the questions that are already in the chat. You guys don't have to go into thorough uh, responses on everything oh, yeah. if you think it's simple, because we'll probably get a bunch of questions as people tune in. Um, I want I want some people to bring bring some uh, you know difficult yeah, questions to the bring table. the smoke as bring Oz would that say smoke. All right, so here we go. Question from oh, Armchair Philosopher. Question crap. for the panel. What do you think about Ralph Ellis' uh, assertion that Jesus was the king of Edessa? I, no? I think it's a, it's a lousy, uh, a really lousy theory. Dr. John? As, as uh, <clears throat> my old Egyptologist professor used to say, it's, it's, not, it's not my field. It's not my field. Okay. So that's, that's pretty late. Odessa's right. formed what, like end of the first millennium? It's a Seleucid period thing. Yeah, but I mean, he's trying to say like he, Jesus was yeah. like the king of yeah. Odessa or something. So I mean, most... I, that's that's way past my. Got it. So you're ready to go ancient Near East. Oh. Doctor Josh is hanging out and bring that uh, ancient Near oh. Eastern. Uh, there heat. we go. There you are. You're back. I got a super chat, yeah, I'm, dude. I told I'm you back. super chats go first, man. Anytime super chats come up, I'm gonna go right to that color oh, all right mr monster awesome. says my question for kip is do you think the naked archaeologist is an atheist <laughs> oh that's a great question um and for those who don't know the naked Ar archaeologist did a uh did a tv show back in the back in the early aughts um in the mid aughts and he uh he produced i think he produced a film with james cameron actually all about the uh the tomb of jesus and jesus's family um i met him a couple times he uh when i was still a phd student i was uh i was working at the shrine of the book in jerusalem and he brought his camera crew down not to talk to me but to talk to um my my supervisors um and so there's actually so there's an episode of the naked archaeologist where I'm I'm hanging around awkwardly in the background, um, but my impression is that he is not an atheist. I get the sense that he's he's like a like a kind of a woo woo sort of sp spiritual kind of hippie guy. Um, He's definitely an opportunist, so whatever whatever he can he can hitch his wagon to, that's going to um, uh, that that's gonna that's gonna help him make movies. He's he's gonna do that. So sounds like, but uh, yeah, interesting yeah. guy. And his name is Sasha Yakubovici, and he's a Canadian. Huh, interesting. Well, thank you, Mr. Monster, for that super chat. I really appreciate it. We man. all we all know each other, right? Here in, in Canada. Pretty much. <laughs> all right, going it's back up. Place. I, I'm trying to do chron chronological order for people who showed up early. Get your questions knocked out and go. Jim Majors, Dr. Majors, question for the panel. How you doing? <laughs> I think that's supposed to be how you doing. How you, how doing? you doing? You guys doing good? <laughs> Doing good. So good. living a dream. Why is why is why is Dr. Majors not on the panel? Um, Laziness, probably. You guys, no, you guys I, I look, I went it. hold on. Now now he's gonna call me after this and he's gonna blame <laughs> me. This is not me, okay? This is not on me oh. only, okay? Uh, uh Dr. Majors, love you, man. I We're feel... gonna be doing some stuff coming up too with him. He's got a debate coming up here on you the should. channel. We're gonna be doing so that's awesome who's he debating uh another guy just kind of a fringe theory uh let's hope it goes successful this time it didn't work out so well with uh, dr richard carrier and uh th that mm. guest that left in the middle of the discussion because it got heated but hopefully it goes through oh. well on this and i can publicly publish it and not have the threat of being sued over my head oh for yeah yeah nice. anyways uh next question yeah. hallelujah here we go um <laughs> Yes, you can ask questions here, Paul. Where do babies come from? So this is a difficult question. Oh, hold on. I got a super chat. Oh, we'll come back. You to have you, two Carmen. super chats. I'm cutting. Dude, when you super chat, you skipped a line. I don't care. I don't care. I'm sorry. In the middle of a question, you you, you skipped a line. Zagros 
Thank you for the super chat. Hey, Derek, Joshua, and Kip, is there evidence for the Bible describing a flat earth in a literal way? Like, in a literal way. <laughs> like, like the Bible, does it actually, you know how Christians will take, well, the circle of the earth, or they'll like find ways to say it's a sphere. Is yeah. that actually accurate or is that anachronistic? And is it really initially kind of a snow globey flat earth with a globe type uh, sphere covering, if you will? Is that is that more accurate? You go, man. You me to, oh, okay. Yeah, you go. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the cosmology in the ancient Near East can be a little tricky to actually fine tune. Right. Um, so if you if you think about, uh, they describe, or they, they talk about the Aetana myth, for example, where Aetana, this king, is riding on the back of an eagle, and he's being taken up to heaven. And it describes the earth as he leaves it behind. And the way that it's described, you know, is indicative of this sort of flat earth that's got a, you know, land mass that's got sea around it. And the same sort of thing shows up in stuff like the Babylonian map of the world. So this cosmology of the earth being this, you know, flat disc-like thing um, with a with a dome over top of it. Um, there are even scholars that, that would argue, and I think reasonably so, that, um, you know, what's, what stands, you know, what's underneath, uh, I think, is, is harder to harder to get a hold of. Um, so certainly the biblical texts talk about, uh, you know, the, 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 the dome being over top and the, the earth having foundations and, um, you know, those, those sorts of things. Certainly that's the, the, the look of, uh, the cosmology of the, the Hebrew Bible, um, which is perfectly in keeping, I think with the ancient Near East. What about yeah. during Dead Sea Scroll period? Would you say it's still the same kind of cosmology? Oh. Has the Greek oh, yeah. uh, concepts influenced the Hebrew uh, worldview yet, or not quite? Uh, not you much. Know, the Greeks had a spherical. Um, you know what I mean? Well, and I think I'm I'm not even sh like I don't know. As far as I know, even that's not not a not a universal. Yes, idea you're right. Within right. within within the Hellenistic world. And I, I mean, there's not, I have to, I have to think hard about this, but um, there is, there's not a great deal of literature at Qumran dedicated to uh, geography. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we're missing too, right? Like we, we are missing, we're places where this sort of thing would um we would see it um, like in the Genesis Apocryphon, if it indeed was uh, a, a text about more than just Abraham um, and we don't have the beginning of it, there's, it's very likely that uh, there, there was some, some more detailed discussion of creation. Um, Jubilees, you know, it uh, it's, it doesn't delve into that very deeply. So it, it's safe to say that um, they're still taking for granted the, the inherited worldview, um, which certainly, and it's never like, it's never explicit. And then one of the reasons for that is because all these, it, it didn't need to be right. Um, people were steeped in this idea about about what what the earth looked like so it was unnecessary to dwell on these things too deeply <clears throat> uh, which is why lots of the descriptions that we have in the Hebrew Bible tend to be uh, my wife is doing her damnedest to, to make sure oh no no what are you doing sorry. I'm very sorry about this, everyone. Oh. You're not there. It's. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Brilliant. It's, yeah. Th thanks. Is that thanks, a, honey. is that moving on its own? <laughs> yes. Put batteries in it. Oh, oh, wonderful! She put the batteries <laughs> in it. So it's good. It's it's good. 
So was I saying <laughs> something or? So, so yeah, you were just, I think you were trying to emphasize that it, it, the worldview, it's not like the, this was talked about too often. There wasn't like a section in the Dead Sea Scrolls that was like, okay, no. and here's how the cosmology of the earth looks and is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we get hints at how the perception of the author is thinking yeah. about things. So that gives us implications on maybe how they, exactly. they didn't have what we have today. The satellites running out there, you know, the earth yeah. stood or the sun stood still. It's the sun's going around the earth. We're the center, that kind of stuff. It's perception. And the, and the reason why that. it's not, a, yeah, the reason why it's not explicit is because it's like I said, it's, it's just, it's, it's taken for granted. It's widely accepted. It's, it's, it's out there. Right. Right. So Awesome. A, yeah. a good go. book, just real quick, a good book to read on this is uh, Hurwitz has a book in the Mesopotamian Civilization series called, I think it's Mesopotamian Cosmic Geography, uh, where he goes into the ancient Near Eastern material and in the that uh, stuff from the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. Uh, I will have a chapter on this. It's one of my four hot button issues in volume three of the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. But, you know, it's going to be. A little while, so if people are interested in getting it now, her of it's is probably a good place to go. I I got an email the other day, by the way. I'm gonna get to the next super chat here, but an email from a flat earther who said, "If you let me come on your show, your world will change. You will see the truth of the Earth being flat, like like he's like dead serious." So anyway, if you wanna, just... if if you're interested in, uh, if anyone's interested in uh, in in exploring this, like within a within a, a biblical model. And having your mind blown, um, famous flat earther Rob Skiba was also, and I somebody I think I heard somebody say that he actually passed away recently. Yeah, that recently passed away. Yeah, yeah. So, but he, but he was like he wrote pro prolifically even before he became a flat earther, but just went he 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 just uh, he just jumped right in uh, to the flat earth stuff and and just wrote and and gave talks that were from from a biblical flat earth perspective were were pretty wild pretty out mm -hmm. there but uh yeah thank you thank you scott duke what are the best sources for english translation of ancient near east text with good critical historical comments probably the the best i'm assuming that one's for me um probably the best one is benjamin foster He's got a book out, it's probably 800 pages or so, uh, called Before the Muses. It's reasonably priced, paperback, but it's <clears throat> Akkadian literary texts in translation. And, you know, good, good, uh, limited commentary. He gives uh, secondary literature editions, uh, you know, major commentaries that have been put on, you know, put together on some of these things. Uh, there's a book <clears throat> that is a publication of a lot of the literary texts that uh, are on ETCSL, which is the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature, which is free online. Uh, you can just Google Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature, and it'll bring up a whole bunch of Sumerian literature in translation. Um, but that was published by Jeremy Black, I think. Um, I can't remember the title, but uh, if you type in Sumerian literature, it'll probably bring it up. But those are really, you know, useful sources. Uh, there, there, like there are there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Like uh, what is it? Lick time has uh, Egyptian stuff. Um, there is a book by Clifford, which is ancient Near Eastern creation uh, stories, where he goes through. I, I think he's got Ugaritic, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, uh, stuff in the Hebrew Bible. Of course, my, Mark Smith and um, uh, I'm blanking on the other guy's name, damn it. But uh, got a bunch of stuff from Ugarit. So, you know, the Baal cycle, Kirta, all these other uh, texts from Ugarit. So anyway. Mm, okay. Thank you so much for that, Scott Duke. Dead Sea Genesis, please ask Kip and Joshua how they feel about Gottwald's hypothesis about the formation of Israel and his groundbreaking the tribes of Yahweh. I, I don't know this one. So, <clears throat> Gottwald is, um, I think this is the Peasants' Revolt 
if I'm remembering that correctly. This oh, is the... oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. God, so, I was thinking of something, something more contemporary. So to couch it, uh, and then you know, if you want to launch in anything, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to sort of con you know to contextualize this, uh, you know, if you read through the biblical narrative, the biblical narrative says uh, is is describing. I mean, there's a difference between how it's laid out in Joshua and what we see in Judges. But you know, as it's laid out in Joshua, you, um, in particular, you have sort of this blitzkrieg. Right, you have Joshua leading the Israelites across the Jordan after conquering some stuff in Transjordan and in the Negev, um, and then conquering cities like Jericho and Ai, Lachish, Hatzor, you know, the north, the south, all this stuff. Um, so that conquest model of the formation of uh, early Israel is what's you know is being described in the biblical text, and this was you know the traditional view for a very long time. Um, other models have come up; <clears throat> they're both. Uh, they're, they're basically insider and outsider models. So the conquest is an outsider model. The Israelites are a group of people that are coming from the outside into Canaan. Another outsider model is called the peaceful infiltration model. So you have like pastoral nomads that are slowly coming across the Jordan and settling in Canaan in the highlands. Uh, then you have insider models, uh, Godwaltz and... Um, Damn it, I'm blanking on the other guy's name. Um, Mendenhall, I think, is the other one mm -hmm. that held to a, a peasant's revolt. <clears throat> I'm pulling this off the top of my head. Hopefully, I'm not messing is this, this up. Does this simply, is this indicating the Canaanites no, themselves right within are, yeah. are yeah. the ones who become? Yeah. Okay. That's right. And it was and it was more of a it was more of a social revolution than an ethnic yeah. uh, right. revolution. And um I yeah. would say that there is like I don't think I I don't think it it works in so far as as Gottwald imagined this to work. But I've always thought there's there is I'm and I'm personally uh I personally find the insider models more attractive. Um and and more in line with what we with what we see in the archaeological record certainly. Um, and what I, I think there's, there's definitely, um, within the Hebrew Bible text themselves, a, a, uh, uh, an element of social marginalization, uh, that, that contributes to this where, and what I mean by that is even if Gottwald's, uh, Gottwald's model itself doesn't work. Um, I think there definitely was uh, a, or I should say that the that the shift from uh, Canaanite to sons of Israel was was um, very much aided by by uh, uh, these uh, these social distinctions, um, these uh, these highland peasants coming down into into the valley. Yeah, <clears throat> and I, like just to 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 sort of piggyback on that and round it out. Um, like the, I think the main critique of the peasants' revolt, besides the fact that it seems like it was born out of like Marxist ideology, uh, which you know I guess sort of maybe drove it a little bit. Um, yeah. Not my area of expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Um, the one thing that was it 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 didn't have archaeological backing as as I remember from the from the secondary literature. But the right. the big thing that I, if I remember correctly, the big thing that it did is it sort of set the stage for or made this uh, introduction of hey these are indigenous Canaanites they're not out you know outsiders. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like today the the <clears throat> and again you know thinking about what archaeologists would say about this, you know, uh, you know, biblical archaeologists would say about this. Um, the majority of scholars are holding to, uh, I would say, the consensus, um, uh -oh. but, but certainly the super majority of scholars are holding to this, you know, insider model. Um, now, there's obviously fierce debate about, you know, who were these Canaanites, somebody like Finkelstein, 
uh, I think would say these are pastoral nomads and the mm -hmm. pastoral nomads are the ones that are settling down in the highlands. Somebody like William Deaver is going to come along. He, he has a 2017 monumental prolegomena um, where he says, no, you know, this is, uh, th th there aren't enough pastoral nomads walking around, you know, or inside of Canaan to fill up the highlands like we had. So there have to be more. So they're coming from cities that are falling apart when the Egyptians lose control over Canaan. Anyway, the point is that while it's certainly not settled what the model should be, um, it seems like the vast majority are holding to these are indigenous Canaanites. Everybody's agreeing on that. Um, if that helped at all. So. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So. Dead Sea Genesis. Thank you for the super chat and the question. Good question. Really good question. Yes. Ben, Ben is back. Uh, my genius buddy, Ben. And he says, Kip, nice shirt. Which bending <laughs> power would you choose? Oh. Moses was a hell of a water bender. I'm all about the water bending. So, so for those who know, Moses, you're wearing... We is, we is tight. We is well, tight. last airbender shirt. Yeah. The last airbender. See, I'm more of a bender bender, right? You know, I like bending girders. That's <laughs> that's what I'm all about, right? To create suicide booths. Yeah. So Ben apologizes. <laughs> and Derek's like, what is he talking about? Let's just move on. <laughs> Futurama references everybody. Futurama. Well, I'll, thank you I'll so let much. It slide, Ben. <laughs> ben you. We're gonna let this one go, man. We're gonna let this one go for sure. Gamer with opinions. Question for Dr. Bowen: What is the best source to research Proto-Sumerian origins? Um, mm. is his name Gonzalo Rubio is probably somebody to read. I'm not gonna be able to pull the article. Um the location of the article I think it's a uh, 2005 uh, I can't remember but he's written on the proto sumerian like the sumerian problem right so uh just so that everybody knows what the issue is uh who were the sumerians who were the akkadians uh do you have the sumerians coming in in like the late 4th millennium as a, like an infiltrating group and uh, you know, how do we how do we distinguish them from the Akkadians? Is it just a, a regional thing? You know, the Sumerians are more in the south, the Akkadians are more in the north. Or it's not that simple, right? Um, and again, <clears throat> this is something that people dedicate their entire careers to as a seriologist. So I won't even begin to walk into it. But um, the one thing that I will say is again, Gonzalo Rubio, R U B I O. Uh, unbelievably brilliant scholar. He's one of these guys that when he lists that he is fluent in 26 languages uh, on his CV, believe him. He's one of the <laughs> few people that are playing with a different deck of cards. Bro, 26? Right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, that's as many. I, I think it's 26. It? It's 16 or 26, but it's crazy. I think it's 26. Um, but uh, yeah, he writes he writes about this quite a bit. So, uh, like in short, I would say um, it's very difficult, if not, uh, uh, you know, ultimately impossible to get back to that sort of thing. At least as it stands now with the data that we have, um, and you can't simply go with like pots equal people, sort of sort of uh, methodology. But um, it does seem like there were. It seems like there were two distinct groups. Maybe <laughs> that's not very helpful, but they merged very quickly culturally. I think it became very difficult to distinguish. It's very difficult uh, to distinguish one from on, uh, from another very quickly. I think in the third millennium. Gamer with uh, opinions. Thank you so much for that super chat, my friend. I do appreciate it, and the question, of course. Probably so, wasn't a very satisfying answer, but sorry. <laughs> now, you know, I just want everyone to know. I'm most sure of the time. There's more questions than answers in a lot of these questions because these are really good. And you guys yeah. know where to look to get further questions. People want to look for answers, but it's like really what you're asking for is better questions because that's really what it's going to boil down to. We'd love to have answers, but it's it's probability and it's 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 theories and things like this that we're or hypothesizing exactly what may be the case. So, yeah, that's that's scholarship. So people like uh, they like the. 
pastor tells you what it is and they just go with it and not really consider being skeptical or critical. So true hell. Thank you for the super chat. He says, Dr. Kip, what is the best book about the Qumran society and or the Dead Sea Scrolls in your opinion? So do you want me to pull this up so everybody sees? the? Yeah. So I, 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 I posted one that I think is really good. This is, uh, this is John J. Collins's beyond the Qumran community, the sectarian movement of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's about 10 years old now. What does that say? 12. I was looking for my copy on my shelf, but I don't see it. Um, but Collins writes, Collins writes really well. Um, he, he writes at a very accessible level for, for everybody. And, and his, his, his ideas are, are, are often, you know, even in his popular books, he often will, will publish novel ideas. So that's a really good one, um, about the, uh, the Qumran community and, um, and about their, their relationship to the scrolls because that's, and that's an ongoing question and, and discussion within the, uh, within the field. Um, in terms of just a general introduction to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, James Vanerkam has written, um, and I think it's it's been updated like three times now, uh, a book called The Dead Sea Scrolls Today, which is um, which is a very a very solid, decent uh, introduction to the texts, and also a little bit about uh, about their origins. So I mean, those are a couple. Um, quite often. What's useful too is when you pick up when you pick up a book, um, like an introduction like that. It's always helpful to check uh, check the bibliography, check uh, the notes, and you're going to find other stuff too that uh, that is worth reading. What do you have there, Doctor Josh? You can't afford that one though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're oh, you're muted. muted, man. You're muted. Sorry, this is my Christmas present. Uh, when you order your own Christmas present, you know that you're nerdy. But um, <laughs> so I'm not really supposed to know this exists. But they weren't that expensive. They're like library copies, really? you know. But uh, yeah, 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 that's a okay. uh, not that I've leafed through it. <clears throat> I haven't done that. Josh, so, we we, we all know that you don't know anything. By the way, we all know that you well, have obviously. to have books to pretend like you do. We all that's, know. Look, if I mean, like, you say that sort of in jest, but I mean, like, I feel like that's my whole role here online, right? Is to say, <laughs> look, I don't know this shit, but look, let me point you to the scholars that do. God. I mean, that's really the, I, I just, it's kind of funny. Your books are based off solid, like consistent scholarship on these ideas. So yeah, we're, we're opening up a different question here. That he we need this. to self-publish them. Uh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sorry, man. All right, I, I, I got another super chat, but I really don't know what what it's oh, yeah. saying. Can you help me? <laughs> Do you know what this is? Kip and yeah, Josh are, are the best. The best. You have to be able to read Hebrew to do this, right? Because you have it's to, true. you know, it's reading true. Semitically, you have to read. Kip right to left. and Josh on. are backwards. Okay, got it. Tacit <laughs> you got it. reticence. Now, thank mean, you so much, Derek. Bobby's now awesome. you're you. Your your Hebrew I'm almost there. is is now on par with mm -hmm. uh, yes. with with uh, Michael Jones and, and S J Thomason. Good Dude, job. I'm finally catching up. I mean, I'm. Oh no, I'm sorry. I made I made Doctor Josh do a face palm. Ouch. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Was that a low blow? You guys Maybe. are trying to low blow on the channel. Um, make it sure that I. <laughs> he's gonna. Count everything. He's not gonna. He's not gonna be my friend. Uh, for very <laughs> okay qu quick question what are your thoughts of this i've never heard this question i'm going back up to the top because i try yeah. to keep in order um if you super chat you cut the line but you ask your questions i'll try and get them in order myth vision podcast what do you people think i'm glad we're people at least we have that uh dignity think about ashraf azat's case about the bible being from arabia Do you know anything? <laughs> you I, don't know. I, I I don't. I don't know anything about the case. I mean, you guys looked at me like, what the? Anyway, okay. So that, there's your answer. Sorry, man. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, they don't know. So, uh oh, well, it's from apostate, apostate prophets. Prophet. 
Question for Dr. Josh. Would you briefly summarize the Sumerian creation myth? <laughs> He's probably sitting back laughing. Yeah, let's see him do it. Briefly. Okay. Um, so there are... I, yeah, so there are different ideas in the mythology about creation, right? So you have, um, yeah, there are different, uh, so heaven and earth having sexual intercourse with one another to bring about life. You have um, uh, sort of these, uh, I mean, if if by intending, or if he's, if he's saying Sumerian here to include Akkadian, or if he's trying to be very specific with Sumerian, I'm going to assume he's, being broad and saying like Mesopotamian, um, but he can interrupt me and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you have you have lots of texts like there are lots of debate poems that Sumerian debate poems that start off with like this pristine time, you know, before things become like they are today, and they often will start off with like these creation motifs where you know um, these these you know, very early entities are coming together or um, something like the Enuma Elish. Again, it's an Akkadian text. I'm, I'm just assuming that he's talking about both. Um, you know, the Enuma Elish is the one that's most popular. Uh, definitely goes back, uh, I would say, arguably very convincingly to um, the probably around the 12th, you know, 1200 BCE, but pro probably a little bit earlier. Um, but describes how, you know, Marduk, you have at the beginning of the text, primordial waters mixing together and, uh, you know, bringing about the deities. And uh, then there, there are problems with the, the main deity gets killed. And then uh, Marduk, you know, is born and he's this major deity with these powers. And uh, he starts really disturbing Tiamat, who's the sea goddess. And um, so she, you know, sets sets in motion a plan to kill all the gods. And so Marduk ends up going up and fighting against her and defeating her and taking her carcass and cutting it in two and stretching out the hide as the heavens. And then, you know, utilizing the, uh, the other half as the earth, uh, you know, makes the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers from her eye sockets. I mean, like it's, you know, describing it in this way. Oh, and apostate process is limited to three sentences. Well, I am already an epic failure here. So um, <laughs> horrible. I'm done. God, sorry. <sighs> Thanks for the super chat, AP. Appreciate it. <laughs> no, there's a lot. I mean, we, we did a few recordings. I think, I don't know if I made those ones public or not yet. We still have like 30, 40 that we never made public yet that mm. are really good. Uh, and you going into how there's intertextuality from the previous one to the more modern Mesopotamian myth. And of course you see a biblical intertextuality there as well, which you guys are going to do a, obviously a thorough yeah. upcoming video. Do I need to, do I need to do it? Do I need to show it? I mean, I could show your little intro. What's yeah, go ahead. Is, you want to show the, the intro? Time? Do you want me to, uh, do you want him to Josh? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. got, okay. Well, we're gonna do it now. Okay, do it now. You're you're lucky. You get to watch this. Okay. You're special. You're special if you watch this. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Hello. Pop that up. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's not in there, Josh. I'm sorry. Oh no, that's good. It's coming. It's, good. it's coming. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Make sure my audio is good here. Here we go. Let me know if this is good. Here's your taco, Mister. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me start full it back. Screen, man. Oh, full. That's right. Jeez, yeah, gotta, good reminder. Get it up Should I go full, go full like Yeah, this? go full full. Yeah, there yeah. you go. go full, All right, there we go. There we Here go. we go. Here's your taco, mister. Whoops, fell in the fryer. I'll get it out. Oh, oh. Yeah. So skeptics want us to believe that Jewish scribes got together at some point in the past and said, you know this pagan epic that claims gods other than Yahweh rule? I think we should take this section where the wild humanoid sleeps with a prostitute and use them as our oldest known ancestors that were set up to rule as priests in God's sacred garden. Sound good, guys? And then everyone clapped. Oh, oh.
Do you want to grow your YouTube channel? Do you Hold want on. to earn more views? Oh, what's oh, happening no. there? Uh oh. Do you want to grow your <laughs> Jeez. I guess that's, I do. That's I really feel like I want to do. Gosh. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I look forward to that. We got a couple super chats, yeah. but All I right. gave everyone a little tease. Let them see what you guys are working on or like something's coming up. So, Dr. Jim Majors, notice I added the doctor oh, there. Wow. I'm, I'm got to oh, wish Oh, yeah. Q4K, do the Dead Sea Scroll support Christian interpretations of the Hebrew text? If not, what are some readings from the Dead Sea Scrolls that are problematic for Christianity? Well, boy, that's a, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to, uh, there's a lot to that question because we're talking about um, copies of the Hebrew Bible texts that uh, interpret the Hebrew Bible, texts that rewrite portions of the Hebrew Bible. I mean, there's a lot going on in there. And it's not an easy, you know, straightforward yes, no um, kind of answer here in terms of whether or not the Dead Sea Scrolls support Christian interpretations of the Hebrew Bible text. In many instances, yeah, they do. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that um that the dead sea scrolls really contributed to um our understanding of uh of early judaism um because they were written at around the same same time that uh jesus lived and uh, and you know shortly before or around the same time that the early church emerged um one of the things that the scrolls showed us was that there are lots and lots of uh, of um, uh, portrayals of early Judaism within the New Testament that are really accurate. Um, I'm thinking on on the one hand, um, this was a big deal when, uh, and I'm going to get the New Testament reference wrong here, but there's a there's a story in the New Testament about um, uh, John the Baptist who's in prison, sending some of his, his followers to go ask Jesus who he is. And Jesus responds to him and says, while well, you tell him, um, the, you know, the, uh, the blind have received sight and the deaf have walked and, or, or sorry, the, the lame have walked and the deaf here. And, and, and he, he pieced together, uh, a set of passages from different parts of Isaiah as an answer, as a response to, john the baptist and for a long time new testament scholars uh and some critics were really you know this is very novel this is unusual we don't have any you know any kind of examples of stringing together these particular texts like this from within existing judaism that that aligns with what uh the new testament writers are doing here and yet lo and behold when the scrolls were discovered one of the manuscripts I believe it's the uh, it's either the the testimonium or the uh, or the messianic apocalypse uh, actually string the exact same passages together in the exact same order. Oh wow! As part of a messianic expectation, so you know what that shows us right at the outset is the New Testament writers were right there within the milieu; they were part of this conversation about who the Messiah was and what he was going to do. So, you know, yeah. And, and really that's, that's a big part of why uh, Christians have, have latched on to glommed on to uh, these texts like they have um, because of, of how valuable they were in, you know, showing uh, lots of the legitimacy of at least the background for the new Testament. Of course, um, you know, there's readings. I've gone through several of these on your show before, Derek. There's there's readings within the scrolls that uh, that also support uh, things that Christians will find problematic, such as the the polytheistic roots of the uh, the Hebrew Bible. We see evidence of that in uh, in some of the scrolls uh, of Deuteronomy. 
Um, some of the things that I'm going to get into when I when I finally put together my own series on the Dead Sea Scrolls are how some some of the texts um, actually illustrate to us some of the manuscripts actually illustrate to us the 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 nature of something like the book of isaiah and the multiple authorship behind that as opposed to its single authorship or fake of news. the development pardon me said fake news multiple authorship fake oh news. yeah yeah well i don't know man uh <laughs> talk talk to the sources josh you gotta talk to the sources so um it, you know the uh, the development of the book of Daniel um, in the second century. These are things that uh, that 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 the scrolls um, have. Uh, you know they tell us about this kind of stuff, and and they they provide some pretty compelling concrete evidence about um, some of these these issues that, that a number of Christian apologists will find uh, uncomfortable. Uh, and this is to say nothing about the conversation with regards to the shape of the biblical text itself. Um, there, are, there are a lot of there are a lot of manuscripts at Qumran uh, that have been designated as as parabiblical or rewritten Bible or reworked scripture. And one of the reasons for that is because they don't fit neatly into the categories of Bible that we already have. Uh, so there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole exciting field of, uh, of research there about, uh, about what the, the actual shape of the biblical text was at the time of Jesus and, and who was, was circulating these things. Hmm. I hope that, I hope that's enough to satisfy yeah. Dr. Jim. I know Josh is not impressed, but yeah. you can't, I don't, can't I don't know. If you may, I don't know if Jim is either, but it's, it's okay. Oh, I'm no. sure, you know, you know. <laughs> No, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the super chat. Brett says, Dr. Kip, assuming the Dead Sea oh, Scrolls man. are genuine, which uh, it seems like there's a conflation on this problem with like what they, what was going on in uh, with the Christians who were buying this off the black market versus what maybe was found yeah. during the times in 1940s. Um, but anyway, assuming they're genuine, what do you say to refute claims that they are not? And uh, Dr. So Bowen, which... Well, I'll ask Dr. Bowens next. Okay. So there's a few things that we can do. And and I'll just to preface this question a little bit, the the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered um or or yeah, discovered and collected between 1947 and 1953. They stem from uh eleven caves in and around a uh a, a set of ruins known as known as Qumran. At Wadi Qumran, they're all within about one and a half kilometers of the site. Um, in total, there's probably upwards of 900 uh, identifiable manuscripts. Uh, there's literally tens of thousands of fragments uh, coming out of these caves. Um, so most of the fragments were discovered by um, by uh, the Ta'amira Bedouin, which is a, a tribe of, uh, of of Bedouin who range around in the uh, Judean desert region, um, they they found most of the material and they were bringing it in and uh, and selling it to to archaeologists and to people working at, uh, at the Ecole Biblique, which is the French school of archaeology in East Jerusalem, and. Um, there have been charges that uh, that the manuscripts themselves are are modern forgeries or even medieval uh, forgeries or medieval copies. Just just quickly, there's a couple ways that that um, we're quite certain this is not the case. First and foremost, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls have been uh, dated paleographically. Meaning we uh, we you know date them based on on the script style and the the paleographical system has proved to be relatively reliable within you know a hundred years give or take in one direction or the other. Uh, these dates have been confirmed also through uh, carbon dating of 
uh, I, I believe it's it's as many as 20 manuscripts. And I know that there's a project afoot now to date upwards of 100 mm. of the manuscripts um, to carbon date. Those were anxiously awaiting the results of that. Um, something that's that's perhaps most important, though, I would say, is that um, after a number of these manuscripts and these fragments were brought in and sold to the to archaeologists, archaeologists actually went out and did their own excavations of several of the caves and found a number of manuscript fragments which they have also uh, identified and matched two manuscripts that were purchased or that, that they purchased from the Bedouin. So what this means is that uh, we're certain these manuscripts were in the caves. Um, and we're certain that they were there for, you know, as, as, as long as they were based on the, uh, on, on the carbon. 14 dates and the uh, and the paleographical dates so yeah I, I mean we're we're pretty convinced and just to just to clarify um when i talk about dead sea scrolls forgeries when you hear any scholar talk about dead sea scrolls forgeries um what we're referring to are um scroll fragments that have purchased have been uh circulated uh purchased and uh, exhibited since uh, since the late '90s, um, you know, there's they're the fragments that were uh, published in in books like these. These this is the uh, the Museum of the Bible fragments. Uh, there's there's 14 in there that are all forgeries. Um, this is the uh, the collection of artifacts and manuscripts in uh that belonging to martin scoyan um a number of which are also forgeries so but these are not these fragments do not look uh similar to the qumran fragments we can't track any of them back to the original finds and uh in many cases um we have uh we, we have documents and records which actually show with with some uh some clarity that they were they, they were forgeries so the the situation with with uh, what's been circulated since the late 90s and the the manuscripts that were discovered in the 40s is completely different and i'll shut up now thank you thank you dr josh which language is the original one world language Is this a <laughs> yes, yes, zoom in on my I'm back and out no. face? Yeah, zoom in on no, my so so face. so let me I guess to, to clarify this question, the way it is phrased, we're gonna take this as a fundamentalist and on face value, exactly what it's saying. So so um let's let's call the world though, not what we think of today, but like the known world. Maybe that's the better way to ask. Or are you asking Brett what is the oldest known language period because that's a different question that we might uh that we know of documented language of course that we would know of so that'd be a different question okay so if if we're looking at this from uh, the earth is six thousand years old and what's represented in the hebrew bible is actually the reality of the original language of the world then i can direct you to my friend stephen anderson's master's thesis where he analyzed genesis 5 <laughs> and 10 and the, the personal names to get at uh, that aspect of proto-Semitic, um, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah. I, sorry, somebody in the side chat said, "What language did Adam speak?" It sounds like if that's the <laughs> if that's the question that we're King trying to James answer, English. <laughs> yes, that is just as likely. <laughs> that is just as likely. Um, and he pronounced S H E W as shoe. All right, so. <laughs> It's, okay, that's a funny. Is this story, an inside it? joke? Are you guys like taking? I had caps? a dis I had a discussion with somebody <laughs> a couple years ago, and the kept said they were King James onlyist, and they kept saying, "No, no, I'm going to shoo you this in in the Bible. I'm going to shoo you this. Here, let me no. shoo you this verse." I was like, "What the hell are you talking? What is sh shoo me?" 
it's because they were pronouncing the old, you know, old English spelling of show, which is S H E W as shoe. I'm going to shoe you, you know, something. <laughs> anyway, it was, um, I normally don't like pick at people for that sort of thing, but, um, I've done I think that it's... back when I was KJV. I used to read it so much. I would like in my personal conversations be like, "Thou better stop that." Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> thou better stop that. Mock, mockest thou me? Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. But if we're talking about the like the oldest written language that we have, uh, it's debated whether it was Sumerian or if it was you know, proto-Sumerian or, you know, whatever. But, you know, let's just say for simplicity's sake that it's Sumerian. It comes from the late fourth millennium. You know, Egyptian, of course, develops very soon thereafter. But we won, ha, 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 um, in Mesopotamia. So, um, you know, it's, it's how yeah. we get down. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, so Sumerian... Sumerian develops in uh, you know these these early texts, uh, and actually, uh, did we put did you put that video out? I think you did. I think I did. Yeah, because it was a competition. Uh, I tried to play big against yeah those who think Egypt was older than Sumerian yeah. in terms of language and writing and and whatnot. But I, it's a confusing question, Brett, that you kind of put here because one world language sounds like you're talking the Tower of Babel. And he like, might be it, having fun. It's possible he's having fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's that's like it's the idea that there was one language, then it got confused. What was that one language yeah. that the Bible's talking about that everyone had confusion of? And uh, French, it was French. What is French? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody know what? Uh, we shouldn't get into this, but now that makes me curious. Now, what uh, what the fine people at Answers in Genesis? I'm sure there's somebody who's who's working very hard at uh, at uncovering what the what the original language was. I I think I mean, it's that's probably right up. There. I mean, I think that's the point of what my friend Dr. Anderson was doing is, um, <laughs> I mean, that's oh, what he was trying to get back to. I mean, you know, what, uh, what was it that the language was not really like? Amazing. Yeah. Interesting. Anyways. Brett, thanks for that super chat and your questions. Um, apostate prophet has a very easy question for you, Dr. Josh. <laughs> so very it, no, one that one's for Dr. Kip. <laughs> that is not for me. Don't you don't you saddle it's, me with that one? Listen, but it's so easy. This should be so easy. I don't understand why you're why you're in the past. <laughs> in the past. That's when they were so, written. So uh, Apostate we, Prophet says, Dr. Kip Davis, when were the books of the Hebrew Bible written? They could only have been written either in the Bronze Age or in the Persian Age. There's this whole thousand-year gap between those when it could, they could not possibly have been written. Um, no, uh, seriously, it's uh, there's it's there's there's literature within the Hebrew Bible that's very very old that I you know I would I would I would think. Uh, some of it possibly even dates back as far as before um, the the year a thousand. Um, most of the literature within there probably stems from uh, the period of the uh, of the divided monarchy. Um, you know, between uh, nine hundred and uh, and six hundred. BCE, the uh, the text within the Hebrew Bible underwent uh, an enormous amount of, of redaction and editing during the Babylonian exile and and after uh, into the the Hellenistic period into the 300s there were texts that were added uh, and included to um, to their the the collections of uh, of sacred literature such as uh, the books of, of Esther and Daniel, um, uh, portions of, uh, of, of uh, Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus, Ezra and Nehemiah, the books of Chronicles, um, huge sections of the Psalms uh, were still being being added to and, and collected in, in this period. So it's a, it's a very, very complicated question. Uh, the development of the Hebrew Bible uh, took place over a long, long period of time. And 
Uh, quite frankly, it's a bit anachronistic even to speak of a Hebrew Bible all the way up until uh, the destruction of Herod's temple in, uh, in, in 70 CE. Up to that point, we have collections of literature. It seems like most Jews uh, in, uh, around the period of, of Jesus in the, in, and in the first century um, held to a Torah of Moses, but even there we're not even sure. Uh, Gabriel Boccaccini is a scholar who's made, I think, some pretty compelling arguments with regards to a competing Enochic Torah to a Mosaic Torah. Um, and you know, they, they were very well aware and collected the, the main prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, the 12, but again, you know, there were different versions of, of these, these books, and there's no guarantee that every, um, sect within Judaism, every, every Jewish group had the same, uh, books. So all the way through. Um, the first century. Uh, this is still a, this is still a question that uh, that the Jews are dealing with, uh, which are which are our sacred texts. So, hmm. thanks. For you know, that. I just want to point out that AP didn't put any you know like three sentence restrictions on Kips. I feel like there's a little bit of favoritism going on. I here. yeah. I I don't know. <laughs> I I still think. Um, my my answer was probably a little shorter though. Ooh, no, ooh. yeah, maybe. Oh, oh, ooh. Ouch. Ooh. <laughs> I keep forgetting that you can see me clearly. I just, it's I can't see you clearly. That, that's what it is. <laughs> oh god. Boom. No, seriously, AP, you should really follow up with that question. Uh, I think you want to ask, which is going to get into something about uh since he's asking when you know it, it usually is relevant to his islamic uh research and stuff and like it gets down into the torah that the the quran and and the traditions of islam has but i'll let him ask it if that's what he wants to ask um yeah i don't know how i'm going to scroll up through the thousands of uh comments already and find out where we left off <laughs> oh, no. but i oh no 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 i'm here i'm here hold on here we go dang i'm still quit. waiting for i'm still waiting for josh to tell us where babies come from i don't know yeah. because like my kids are all adopted so <laughs> that's yeah i think you would know you better know than all of us i tell you what i'll ask megan if she wants to come in here and let us know <laughs> while she's holding two of them oh my gosh <laughs> um this might be outside of your guys's field but uh johan i hope i'm saying your name right what do you think is hidden in that buried library in Herculaneum that uh, Dr. Richard Carrier mentions sometimes? <gasps> do you guys ever guess? <laughs> did you, you don't know? Did you mean to yawn there? Were you yawning at the question or yawning just because <laughs> you have so many kids and we know that you know where they come from and you're just not wanting to tell us? Sorry, I yawn all the time now. This is like, <laughs> this is my MO. I guess okay. that's what happens when you have babies, eh? Yeah, it's what happens. Yeah. Okay. It's what happens. Um, qu another question. Uh, let me see. If Dr. Josh studies in the ancient Near East, why is his video in the modern Near West? Ooh. <laughs> but um. All right, all right. Uh, someone uh, Ben says checkmate atheist. <laughs> uh, and Jim said, I "See how you feel about me." <laughs> Hi, Kip and Josh. Do you know uh, David Falk's channel, Ancient Egypt in the Bible? He's an Egyptologist and claims to have evidence for a real exodus. Kip, are you aware of him? I, I've never heard of it. Do you know what? Y'all <laughs> <laughs> better stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we, uh, uh, we do know. We're well aware yeah. of him. There's a lot of people on the internet uh out trolling around using uh one of the videos that he was recently done oh. i'm trying to set up honestly i really want i'm trying to set up a debate with him and dr ronald hendel on this topic because you know dr hendel if i may uh you know wrote in this wonderful book here i think this is the right am i at the right one here i think this is it um maybe it's this no it's this you guys seeing that 
It is a really good book. Yeah, the five views where there's like a debate and five different views of the Exodus and Ronald Hindall, of course, wrote on this. So um, it'd be highly recommended for anyone to read. But yeah, I'm trying to set that up. But I think Dr. Falk's actually got a lot of family problems going on right now, and he's not able to actually do anything. Uh, I wrote so, him. and so, so just so it's clear, like that book is is really useful. It's an evangelical publication, right? So, you know, f I think there are five contributors, four out of the five, um, you know, are coming from a very clear evangelical perspective. The first uh, stripling, I think, is uh, the traditional view, you know, 15th century um, conquest, you know, same thing that, like Bryant Wood would argue for. Um, and then James Hoffmeyer argues for the more mainstream view, 13th century Exodus. Mm -hmm. And then like Rendsburg is in there. Uh, I can't remember who uh, the other one is. And then Ronald Hendel argues for cultural memory. But the, the nice thing about the book, whatever it is that you walk away from it thinking positively, like, you know, oh, I, I hold to this position or to that position or whatever, it lays out the arguments very, very well. And you get to see what the data points are that everybody's having to wrestle with. So like, you know, Stripling lays out, oh, here is, um, you know, the Sinai inscriptions that are put out by, um, oh, why can't I, I'm blanking on his name, Petrovich, right? And then Hoffmeyer's like, mm, no, <laughs> you, 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 you can't, you can't really, that's not, that's not good evidence like that. So, uh, and I, of course, everybody else says it too. But um, yeah, it's just it's really good to see. Uh, even even though I, yeah, I wish it weren't from such a fundamentalist leaning publication. That's that's what the publication is. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I still think it's very very good, worth the read. It's excellent. All things excellent. Awesome. Yeah, highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in hearing. Dr. Handel, of course, his particular, if you're skeptic yeah. and you're interested in looking at the cultural memory side of things, it's there. Um, mm -hmm. Super chat from Vesper. Thank you so much for the super chat. Question for both. Is there anything you can say about how Sumerian or Babylonian astrology cosmology carried over to Jewish? <sighs> Those types of questions like carried over. Um I guess it depends on what is meant by that. We're going to be dealing with trying to define some of those terms more precisely in this upcoming video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so certainly there is an ancient near. Okay. Let, let's just say this sort of broadly, maybe to, to lay the groundwork for what's coming up. There is in, in the same way that there um, are like, West concepts in Western civilization, you know, like Western uh, concepts of justice or Western concepts of, um, you know, morality that, that you, you might have two different legal, um, you know, sets of laws or, 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 or uh, the ways that people have addressed uh, certain crimes in you know, Great Britain and how they're addressed here in the United States, separated by, you know, all that distance and even by time, and yet they handle it in similar ways, right? That doesn't mean that one is necessarily borrowing from the other. It means that there's this sort of Western way of thinking about law, right? Okay. So mm -hmm. on, on, on the one end of the spectrum, you just have, um, you know, what's it, and ideas are in the air, Right. Mm -hmm. Concepts are in the air. This is the way that people are thinking yeah. in the ancient Near East. Um, and so you see this in different areas. So in jurisprudence, right, in these different law collections, you see stuff in the Hebrew Bible. You can't necessarily say, oh, look, even though I do think there is you know, utilization, right. let's say, going on. Conscious and, in, and intentional. Yeah. Um, but you you can't say in every place, oh, look, we have... Uh, you know, something like in Deuteronomy 22, uh, something happening. And we see this in this other ancient Near Eastern law collections, a similar sort of thing. This must be borrowing directly from ancient Near Eastern law collections. That, that You can't just assume that because they're similar. They're, they're similar mindsets. Okay, with that being said, um, 
that doesn't mean that there is no interaction between them. We we can't take that approach and say, well, just because there's it's all in the air, that nobody's borrowing from anybody else. And what we mean by borrowing is still complicated. We'll get into it. But on the other end, you have mm-hmm. the actual idea of, you know, we have this cuneiform tablet and, you know, or this, you know, this this text that's being utilized over here in Mesopotamia. And the Judean scribe is thinking about Gilgamesh and thinking about the story and going, I'm going to very intentionally rework this or speak against this, right? So you have different ends of the spectrum and then every fucking thing in between, right? So coming at this simplistically and saying, well, it's all in the air, so they're not borrowing and they're borrowing everything from everybody else. Like, you you can't you can't just drop your anchor in one of those two. You have to have a methodology um, that allows you to see the nuance through that whole spectrum. Wow, yeah, I'm just fascinated um, with your f bomb. But go ahead, Tom. <laughs> it, I think it was I think it was necessary. That was necessary, discussion. bro. Yeah, it was. It was. So. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, Dr. Kip, did you want to... Um, I'm not, I'm not so I did want to, uh, because the question is specifically about astrology and cosmology. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, but that's, I mean, no, no, that's fine, Josh. It was, you know... You, he, pre- he, like, uh, that rolled was out the red carpet. Yeah. There that you was go. Important yeah. to say. Um, I don't know if it's reflected as clearly within the Hebrew Bible. Um, but there certainly is a, there certainly is a, a Jewish, uh, astrology, um, in the second temple period, uh, definitely. And there's, there's some overlap. I'm, I'm unfortunately don't know a lot about this, but there's, I mean, I know as much as, as there are, uh, a number of texts within the Dead Sea Scrolls that have been designated as horoscopes. Um, there's a text called, uh, called Forky Brontology, which is, is, yeah, it's a, it's a brontologia or, um, a type of a horoscope that, um, is similar to, to things that we saw, uh, things that we see within the, the Hellenistic period written, uh, in Greek. So, um, all that to say, uh, there definitely is some carryover and some some crossover uh between what the mesopotamians were doing between what the the early greeks were doing and and what the the jews were doing in the uh in the second temple period Hmm. thank you thank you gentlemen i appreciate it ben swartz says is in genesis 10 5 there's a mention of maritime people with their own language, who were these folks with a different tongue prior to Babel? Well, Go I mean, forth, within yeah. the text, I, I don't think we, I mean, I don't think we can say they had a different, from from a textual perspective, I don't think we can say they have a different tongue. Um, I don't believe that's, that's spelled out specifically. Um, these are just, I mean, these are just the, uh, the, the descendants of Yafet here, I believe. Um, so what is this, what does this say here in, uh, Genesis two? So, I mean, the, the Genesis, Genesis 10, 10, five. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Genesis 10, two, I was looking at. So the Genesis 10 de- genealogy is, um, is, is basically structured in such a way to, to introduce, um, the uh, the surrounding nations, uh, essentially everybody that the that the the Hebrew people know about, um, and to assign them to one of the these the sons of Noah. So it starts off with the uh, with the sons of of Yafet, I believe, and then it, it goes on to the sons of Ham, and then uh, finally it lists the uh, the sons of Shem, which are uh, uh, from which uh, Abraham uh, descended. So, um, and uh, something that I, I outlined in uh, my own uh, video on the documentary hypothesis was that this genealogy is very clearly constructed of two separate genealogies. Um, but all that, so all that to say what what they're doing 
Um, and you can't you can't read these things too too literally either, because uh, quite honestly, people in antiquity, you know, they didn't they had general ideas about where they came from or where a certain people group or a certain nation came from, but it wasn't it wasn't especially precise. Um, so. As far as I know, the 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 mention of uh, people branching out. Well, I'll just I'll just read it here. Um, the descendants of Yafet. This is starting in ten two. Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yavin, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The descendants of Gomer um, were Ashkenaz, Rifath, and uh, Togarma. The descendants of Yavin, Elisha, and Tarshish. The Kitim. And the Dodanim, from these, the the coastland nations branched out. And then it says, these are the descendants of Japhet by their lands, each with their language, their clans, and their nations. So, I mean, uh, the um, uh, right away, uh, Yavin um, is Greece. Uh, the Ketim are, are thought to be... Um, in the on the Italian peninsula, so I I would say that this is what is being communicated here that uh, that that the people are 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 you know all, are, the rest of, of the sons of Yafet are probably um, thought to be coastland uh, dwellers and maritime people. So thank you, thank you. Sure. All right, M Doug. Do you think and thank you for the super chat, uh, Ben? Uh, thank you for the super chat, M Doug. Do you think that Gilgamesh may have also been educational since the entertaining, almost uh, almost audience participation style in some parts is compelling? Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no question. Um, so one of the things that I think is is really uh, it's it's not as well known. Uh, is that much of Sumerian and Akkadian literature, but particularly Sumerian literature, comes from uh, scribal education context, right? So, you know, you go back to like the city of Nippur, for example, you have this huge cache of literary tablets, uh, literary texts that come from uh, the old Babylonian period, early second millennium. And it's a scribal school, right? Um, so the way that students learned the scribal craft, how they how they went to school, uh, was by copying out texts. And actually, <laughs> shameless plug here, but this is a popular version of my dissertation that I published, uh, learning to pray in a dead language, and it's all about education and prayer in ancient Sumerian. So I go through house you know th this whole thing in great detail in that in that book but um yes yeah, so literary texts were copied out specifically for education right and there's there's a lot that goes on with that and what that what that entails but uh we find fragments of the epic of gilgamesh uh, throughout the ancient near east in educational contexts so yes and there's no question that gilgamesh was copied um you know, as part of uh, scribal education. Mm, 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 mm. No I'm dignity, go, no doubt. I'm going to go ahead, ahead and blame Mitch for setting Danny up with this super chat. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Mitch uh, tells Danny to step his game up on like difficult uh, questions. And here it is for Dr. Josh. How does he respond to the rule following problem? Given the paraconsistent <laughs> status of Munchausen trilemmas of his worldview, since there's no quantitative aspect of his own beingness. It's an easy one though, right? Like super easy. Listen, Danny, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks I, think, that, I think that this is a standard begging the cognitive bias fallacy. Okay. Contingent dualistic responses to epistemology, um, they reflect such an epicureanistic ethos, <laughs> leveling off, in my opinion, in an appeal to authority accident fallacy, if I might be so bold. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> 
Danny, hey, Danny's a sharp dude. Seriously, if you guys haven't, um, you know, if you're into philosophy, for sure, his channel's about that. Go check him out. I mean, he's got like some really good stuff on philosophy. Go subscribe to Danny. And uh, thanks again, man, for the super chat. I, he I don't has, even he know has created a monster in me. He said he said so himself. Uh, yeah. I, I do this sort of thing where I troll people in streams asking oh goofy questions. That... God, you do it to me hey. all the time. <laughs> Can I, can I just say here? I think I wanna. I think I wanna uh, change my name to Doctor Kill. <laughs> there's, uh, oh. <laughs> there's... Why? <laughs> well, because Mark Mark von Wisco said at Myth Vision Podcast, "Hello, Derek. Could you please put links to the books recommended by Doctor Josh and Doctor Kill?" <laughs> the video That's brilliant. Thanks. So, oh, man. I'm Doctor Kill, awesome. everyone. You would like that, actually. I'm sure oh, you wouldn't mind. Man, wow, pretty cool name, huh? Um, give the Christians yeah. definitely something to talk about then. Uh, but no, uh, if you want to link it in the comment section, if you want to post them, go for it. Oh, you should yeah, already should. be a moderator, I think. I if not, I'll go ahead and log in and make sure that you are. That you can, you guys could should be able to plug your own stuff anyway, so that way you're good. Yeah, I think I can. Um, I want. I, it might be best though. Yeah, just. Oh, you you said to put it in the video description, right? No, no, chat, chat. Go ahead and chat it. Oh, you think so? It might be best in oh, the yeah. description so people don't have to scroll through it all. We can but, do that uh, too. I'm just saying, if you wanted to yeah. get them to, you can. Okay. Okay. Um, but I'll. I yeah. Maybe just put it in the description. So, at the end. Just send it to me. Yeah, just send it to me, for sure. Okay. Um, super chat from JD man six. Is there a connection between the names Ishra and Israel? I have heard this claimed. Have you heard of this? What language is Ishra? Yeah, I don't know that I know what Ishra is. JD man, find out what language that's in my friend. And where did you hear it claimed? That might help too. So guys, so, be on the lookout for that too. But do you have anything you might could say? Where yeah, I mean, like Israel, it's not, uh, it's not settled. I mean, it's still debated what Israel means, but it's like to contend yeah. with ale. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what Ishra. And and these things is. too uh, within within the Hebrew Bible too. I think it's it's also worth pointing out. One of the reasons it is contested about what it means is because um, it looks like the the writers of the Hebrew Bible were also wrestling with uh, with the origins of their own their own uh uh nation name people group name so i'll be on the lookout for jd man six's uh comment there just keep an eye out guys because i got so much here too um yeah. next super chat mr james lowry thank you so much are the essenes who called themselves oh. zadokites one and the same as the both essenes i hope i'm saying that right does this connect them to judas the galilean the boethusians um boethusians yeah, Come on, that's actually, Derek. I mean, it's only you know. You're right. It's a small, simple. Anyone should get that word. You're Anybody. Right. That's a, anyone should have known that. But that's a good. That's a good question, though. Um, and I'm I I don't know. I'm afraid I don't know a lot about uh, about Judas the Galilean. Uh, the Boethusians were identified themselves as. Or, or I, I believe are, are, are connected to uh, uh, the Sadducees, as they're called in the uh, in the New Testament, um, and by Josephus. Josephus, uh, this is one of the groups that uh, that he identifies along with the Pharisees and the Essenes and the Zealots, um, and I believe that's in I believe that's in in his uh, in his Jewish wars. Um, but uh, yeah, it so the Essenes and, and the relationship of the Essenes to uh, the Sadducees or to the Sadakites um, is something that that is not is not settled. Also, um, it was popular, I think, for groups pretty well all the way throughout the second temple period to call themselves Zadokites. So I, you know, you end up getting um, even competing sects trying to, to claim this, 
this uh, this name very much like uh, like B'nai Yisrael, the sons of Israel. You'll see throughout the Second Temple period, different Jewish groups claiming that they are the sons of Israel. So, um, but there's definitely uh, a relationship between uh, the Essenes and the Sadducees uh, in terms of the fact that they're both uh they're they're both um part of the cultural social elite uh certainly and they both also have connections to the jerusalem temple um the group at qumran which we tend to think of uh, as as a group of essenes may have been even more closely connected to uh to the sadducees to the sadakites um and you know, we see this through a lot of their polemical literature. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, about how this particular group was disenfranchised from the Jerusalem priesthood and, you know, ended up coming out and having to start doing their own thing. Um, they felt so strongly about it that they completely, you know, they said, you know, the, the, the Jerusalem temple, the whole system is completely corrupt and we're just waiting out here in the desert and, um, for the end of the world and in the meantime we're worshiping in the celestial temple with uh god and the angels and uh, something that's really interesting is is that uh it, a case could be made that the people actually living out in in uh at the site qumran and who were you know collecting and and writing uh these dead sea scrolls had regular um rituals out in the out in the desert in which they imagine themselves actually actually participating in worship in the uh, celestial temple with god so i i, I feel Thanks. like i kind of tracked a little sideways on that one but i mean my the what i know about the boethusians is is very small you, so, you you mispronounced that. that but it, it's okay yeah well um <laughs> i mean we can't we can't all aspire to your your i know i know look i'm not even arguing with you i'm just saying yeah. you know i'm just letting you know like it's hard to get there look we only have a um a few more super chats and i know that you had to go okay. somewhere dr kip so i want to make sure i still we, got we... i still got 30 minutes so well okay. i want to keep it within that time gives you time dr okay. josh has got stuff to do too and i want to make sure everybody's yeah. good though thank you for that uh super chat James and tacit reticence. This is going to be a very, I don't know if you can get the answer to this, but is there a link between Scooby-Doo and the Enuma Leash? So there, there are some manuscripts. Can you do it um, in, in the Kent Hoven um, voice, if you don't mind? Because <clears throat> this is serious. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You should probably call him. Yeah, yeah, it's good to, oh, good to be back oh, with you right. guys. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> hi, 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 how you guys doing? Uh, my name's Ken Hoven, uh, high school science. I uh, taught for fifteen years. Okay, I'm here to help. Uh, yeah, so let me just tell you, let me just tell you about these uh, these two texts. Uh, one, one is a favorite of mine, a Scooby Doo. Uh, of course, I uh, I love Scooby Doo. Uh, it shows that dogs uh, never produce non dogs. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, so when you think about this, uh, this text that, uh, <clears throat> of course, we know comes from the Bible. Okay, it's called the uh, Enema, Enema, Enema Elish, um, <clears throat> uh, and and that's about what it's good for. Okay, it's it's about good for an enema. Okay, because that's uh, <clears throat> it's, 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 it comes from the Bible. Yeah, just just like uh, just like with an enema. <clears throat> yeah, <up>. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, th th there really is a connection between them because uh, you know if you think about how uh, Scooby Doo and uh, that that uh, that. A uh, hippie, uh, Shaggy, of course, uh, someone that uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think is uh, really off his rocker. Um, uh, it, you know, they they, they always say uh, they, uh, the, the what do you call it? The criminal, criminal. Yeah, I should know. That. <clears throat> I should know that word. Um, the criminal uh, always says, uh, "I got I got away for it from it. I got I got away with it too, uh, except uh, for those pesky kids." And uh, actually, there are manuscripts that uh, Tiamat says something like that. You know, I, I, I would have gotten away uh, with killing those gods, except for those pesky, uh, pesky kids, uh, one of them being Marduk. Okay? I'm here to help. Hey, but listen, I don't have time to sit around and talk with you guys. You guys are probably all thinking Marmaduke. about 14-foot whale penises, okay? Was it Marmaduke? <laughs> I think Mar all right, look, a, I got to get out of here. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, listen, listen, you just remember, uh, per particularly you, uh, uh, Do Dr. Kill, uh, you just remember that uh, you, if you don't repent, you're going to burn in hell. Okay. All right. I'm here to help. Thanks. Gonna... Thanks so much, Kent. Right. Uh, 
Oh Kent's God. gone. Kent's gone. Oh, Kent's gone. Man, that guy. Holy that guy's. Is... You get missed out of here. that. Yeah, I, I can't know. stand that guy. That guy. I mean, he just. What's his problem anyway, man? Tacit, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. I hope that Kent solved that riddle for you. Uh, it's a little difficult to. We needed his expertise because nobody knows science like him, and he used the scientific method there. Um, is it Bibble Babble? Thank you so much for the super chat. Dr. Josh, does the Sumerian Mesopotamian myths have some story like the Tower of Babel? Derek, great show. Do you I'm need to get to Ken to answer this one? I'm just kidding. Don't, <laughs> no. no, no, no. <laughs> I doubt he'll come back on camera. Yeah, he's mad <clears> at um, us. He's mad at us. Yeah, you guys thinking about those whale penises, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so certainly there is a there is a tr there's a tradition that we see. Um, for example, there's a text called um, Enmerkar and uh, the Lord of Arata, and in that text, it talks about how there was a time, and it's there are articles that have been written on this. The Sumerian's a little tough, but um, it, it seemed to talk about this time when when language was unified and then afterwards language became diverse uh again there, there's some contention about that whether it's languages were diverse now they become unified but like a, like a future thing but um as far as like an actual story a mythological text that references the tower of babel uh i can't think of one off the top of my head don't don't let that you know uh to you mean that that that, that doesn't exist a good place to look for something like this, specifically in light of that. David Carr has a recent publication out that Kip, I can't remember what the title is, um, but oh, it's on yeah. Genesis. It's got Genesis one through eleven oh, yeah. in the uh, formation in the title. Genesis one through eleven. Yeah. Um, but the the thing about uh, the Tower of Babel story is that it's pulling very clearly from the ziggurat, uh, you know, that stands New Babylonian ziggurat. Um, so there's, there's certainly a connection there. Uh, but as far as trying to find, yeah, there's the book right there. Excellent. Uh, and it's coming down in price slowly, but surely, which is nice. I'm adding that to my recommended book list. So we can, you can go there if you want to find it, but I'm going to, I'll post it right now in the chat. So people have it. So, go ahead. um, maybe, no, no. maybe this is a, or are you done Josh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. More, I, I thought, I wondered if maybe this is a good time also to mention the, uh, um, the Tower of Babel stele from uh, which is in mm. the Skoyan collection, um, and probably uh, probably was looted. Uh, but um, there's actually a so there's a marker that uh, Martin Skoyan has in his collection. It's about uh, it's about yay big. It's like a foot by a foot, um, and uh, it's got a picture on it of uh, of Nebuchadnezzar holding a, a scroll and then a picture of uh, of Hammurabi's uh, ziggurat and it's a dedication the dedication on it is basically uh, to commemorate um, Nebuchadnezzar's renovation of this um, of this temple and uh, if you read the inscription uh, it's it's laced with all sorts of uh, of terms and language that echo or that are I would then say are echoed in the Hebrew Bible story of the Tower of Babel. Things about you know the the top of the tower reaching up to the heavens. Things about uh, you know mixing uh, uh, bitumen um, and pitch to make more. Things about um, everyone from all the nations coming uh and uh, or nebuchadnezzar putting everybody from all the surrounding nations under his 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 control to to get this job done um the parallels are really really interesting i personally think that the the tower of babel story has some connection uh to this and was possibly written as mm. a as a as a subtle subtle not so subtle critique <laughs> of, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, the 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 man of pride, as he's uh, as he's identified in in other texts, such as in, uh, in Jeremiah. 
So, that is know. interesting. It's a, it, there's yeah. a huge rabbit hole there too to really try oh, yeah. and consider. Hey, for everybody tuning in, go check out Dr. Kip and Dr. Josh's YouTube channels. And I just posted a link to all the books for Dr. Josh, so you guys can help you know support what he's doing by gaining information that he has studied and gathered and collected in the books. All right, we got a few more super chats. We really need to get and try and uh, bust them out because. You know how we do. We will go on and on. And uh, <clears throat> which one of you goes on and on longer is a debate. But either way, uh, you know, it's, it seems clear in this episode. We don't really know. It's just, <sighs> there's a competition here. I could see apostate prophet, my friend. Thank you so much, Ridvin. He says, question for Dr. Davis. The Quran is very angry at the Jews because they say Ezra is the son of God. Why do Jews say something so outrageous? Thanks. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't you know. Do you know, you do know that I'm they say sorry. that there, God has no son. So like they're clear. They hate the idea. Well, I, I understand they, that. I'm not yeah. sure what the, I'm not sure what the source of uh, Ezra, the son of God. Um, that the Jews call the, him the son of God. Yeah. Hey, Ridvin, if you're in here. A, that might right, be a rabbinic thing. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, which is which is not my which is not my thing. Um but uh I'm my my apologies, apostate prophet. I, I have no idea what uh what that's about. Okay. But well, they're right. I mean, clearly Ezra wasn't the son of God. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the source or anything like that, but they're definitely big time against God having like any sons. So uh don't know if the, the yeah. context son of God it means what uh, we think. I don't know. Someone said, uh, JM's is in really enjoying this. Thanks all. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for the super chat and the kind words. Um, Dr. Kill. I'm just looking. I noticed that again. <laughs> I'm scrolling through. Uh uh, I don't want to butcher your name, uh, my friend. Uh, but yeah, he says, uh, "Is the let's name just call him Enki." Enki, because <laughs> that's go. what his Kine that's what his cuneiform says. Oh, is it? Okay, see. Yeah. This oh, that's is, awesome. Is the name uh, Mushu from Mulan sidekick dragon related to the Sumerian? I don't know. Huh. This... Yeah. Um, I don't know. I haven't. I don't. It's. If I have seen Milan, I don't remember it. So this thing behind me is a mushkushu. Um, and it comes from two Sumerian words. Um, one is like serpent, dragon. Yeah. And then the other is khush, which is um, like fierce, right? So the mushkushu is like the fierce snake or um, fierce serpent, whatever. Um, so... Yeah, whether Mushu comes from that, I mean, that'd be interesting. I, of course, I don't know. Um, I always think about that dragon as know, the one in the Genesis account. Like it has this, you know, idea of it. I don't know. It's, it's, it's like a snake with legs. I mean, it's serpentine, like so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the after just saying I know nothing about. Uh, uh, about rabbinic literature there's actually uh <laughs> i'm um, gonna wax eloquent on it for 10 minutes no no <laughs> uh, i mean this is something that's that's carried forward by the genesis rabba right um this idea that uh that part of the punishment for the serpent was that he had his legs cut off right um, right and that that's why I, if correct me if i'm wrong the serpent behind you i'm gonna call him a serpent this mushu if i could use the term is that guarding a temple mushu. Is that the it's, idea? It's, it's on the Ishtar gate. It's one of the gate, yeah. It's one of the um, figures that shows up on the Ishtar gate. At the, I just uh, know but, some scholars look at the the creation in Genesis as kind of temple language, like an established sure. temple. So here you have a serpent potentially in a garden. I don't know if this is representative of a temple, if it's symbolic, if it's literal. It's it, there's so many ways to kind of uh, wrap your head around this stuff. But I, I didn't know if there was a carryover of this this figurine if you will behind you and the genesis uh serpent hey hey josh yeah, did you go that. uh when you were in germany did you go to berlin to see the no Gate? no um <laughs> it's 
if That's anybody's funny. anywhere near Berlin, you got to go see it. It's uh, it's remarkable. <laughs> I have to say, um, just very, very quickly, I was made fun of by my archaeology professor. Uh, I think it was in my first year, first or second year, I think. Um, I, what was I? I don't remember what I was talking about. But I said, yeah, it's in the uh, it's in the Berlin Museum. And he looked at me and laughed and said, which one? <laughs> <laughs> the Checkpoint Charlie Museum. <laughs> I was like, shut up. You know which one I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh and by the God. way, just, just so everyone knows, Josh was in Germany for for uh, for the was that the Fulbright or was that the? Um... Yeah, it was for it was a Fulbright scholarship and yeah. a day on day uh, German the, the German scholarship. Mm. So pretty much what you're saying is he has no credentials whatsoever and everything he says is bogus. Okay, cool. Thank you. Don't listen to Dr. Josh, I guess, at this point. Uh, no. It's a good way to operate. It's a good yeah, way to yeah. operate. Yeah, yeah, that's that's common sense, right? No. <laughs> uh, seriously, thank you for that last super chat. Jake 4D, oh my gosh, Dr. Josh. Are you talking about Dr. Josh or Ken Hoven? Because Yeah, I mean. I think he means Kent. You are the best 10 out of 10 to Kent. So Definitely. Yeah. For sure. For or sure. 14 out of 14. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And add Sorry. a well in there. You guys somewhere. know that story? Do you know the story? No. About the 14 foot whale this. penis? Oh, yes. So he, yes. he had a debate with Godless Engineer. And like somehow, like the, 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 uh, the topic like the, of evolution and then the. Yeah. And the, and the, like the whale's 14 foot penis or something. And, and GE went. Wait, what? I couldn't hear you. What happened? You broke up. <laughs> he said, and then he's hey, like, you heard me, you pervert. <laughs> <laughs> you heard me, you, you pervert. You just... it, was, it was funny. <laughs> and then he made an intro song out of it for his show. And the whole show played this like 14, 14, inch, 14 foot penis. <laughs> and it's like echoing. Oh, it was the best. That, I told him, I said, you should keep that as your uh -huh. intro. Literally. Uh, I don't know if that messes up oh, monetization man. or not, but it's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Thank you so much. Stop scamming, man. Do the multiple shrines at the Kerbet? Am I saying that right? Mm, Kerbet Kerbe Kayafa. Yeah. Kerbet Kayafa suggests polytheism. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know enough about it, but I, I, I. I would, I would expect, I would expect like likely i mean the archaeological parlance throughout the the whole region has a ton of stuff uh that indicates pretty pervasive polytheism so i you know i would say yeah probably safely i i honestly don't know okay uh, thank you so much stop skimming man is back any thoughts on the idea of the old testament makes attempts to uh, alibi King David and cover for rebellion and politically motivated killings. I think that uh, Joel Baden does a yeah. Joel Baden's got a phenomenal book yeah. on this topic. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's like there's clear spin, right? The example that he always gives that I think is fantastic <laughs> is just walking through what you would do if uh, you know uh, uh, a couple of guys walked into in New York City walked into a shop owner uh, and said, hey, uh, got a beautiful uh, display window up front here. You know, uh, my boys and I, we've been we've been making sure that nobody threw any bricks through it for the past six months. Just want to let you know that. So, uh, you know, you should pay. You should pay my boys for their time. <laughs> it's like, um, wait. <laughs> I haven't been, I didn't ask anybody to, people don't throw bricks through that. Oh man, it, this is a beautiful piece of glass. I'd hate for people to throw bricks through it. Uh, and we stop them. So you should pay us for our time, right? Those are mobsters, right? It's a shakedown. Yeah. But when David does it, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. uh, Naval is just this horrible fool, yeah. right? Who, uh, is, you know, his wife has to well, come out. Well, I mean, I'm so sorry. His, his parents named him the fool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is what Psalm 14 one is about. Naval has said, 
There is um, no God. Right, anyway, yeah, it's sorry. not anyone else. So if you say yeah. it, you <laughs> don't count as a fool. Yeah, that's it. So. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> there, there's, there's possibly also some within the text of the Hebrew Bible. There's possibly also um, some pushback against the uh, against the house of David. Um, it's not a it's it's not a, a popular argument, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, the story of the rape of Tamar in uh uh gen or sorry the yeah the story of um uh tamar in genesis 37 the uh the wife of one of the sons of uh, uh judah who uh was promised to uh his brother and it's th this whole story of of judah ending up sleeping with uh with tamar um because because he wronged her um it's been suggested that this this could possibly be uh constructed on the story of the rape of tamar from uh from uh second samuel is a chapter hmm. chapter 11 i think um now why would they do that the thought is that this is a uh this is a social critique that somebody is uh, is is writing this rather veiled piece of prop piece of of counter propaganda against the house of David, as if to say, look at all the shit that's going on in you know the royal palace where where David can't even keep his his kids under control. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a widely it's not a widely uh, thought of idea but I, i've always found it kind of interesting and the reason for it is because when you look at when you look at the names of the characters in each story it's very very difficult to to not see that they are closely connected to each other it's kind of cool. hmm. something yeah. to examine there that's pretty interesting yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if you're looking for a way out, a uh, cop out, and you use the Bible as your worldview, um, you can use Genesis 38 and then get away with you know prostitution uh, and and just say, look, this was actually okay with Judah. Why is it not okay with me? So uh, just letting other you know everyone know you can do it yourself. Absolutely condone the morality there, there is go. clear. Um, Lawrence J. Backler, thank you so much for the super chat. What is what would be your best stillman argument for the gospels indeed being written by the traditional name des described? You guys Do you have, have one? A, um... I mean, this certainly isn't my area of expertise. I mean, I would, if I had to argue it, I would probably say, well, the earliest, right? There aren't the earliest manuscripts that we have. Um, have I don't no? think we can do that no because no. the earliest well i mean you could but i mean they're not that early like we have right. a handful of second century manuscripts and none of those have attributions on them because they're not you know they're they don't stem from the start of the gospels i think the earliest manuscript attestations come from at least the third century if not later but anyways, this is why you don't want me the, arguing your, you know, for for your uh, <laughs> fundamentalist positions. So you don't want me doing it. I, so, but I think I think the the arguments, I mean, the arguments that that tend to be forwarded are that the the these these um these second century Christian apologists like uh, like Ignatius, and I'm probably going to get these guys wrong, and Dustin Martyr and. Uh, um who are some other ones um I mean, irenaeus is well, late I, late <clears throat> yeah late second century but yeah yeah so i mean it, there's you know there's attribution by these guys of the gospels to um matthew mark luke and john um but some of those are are problematic too i think um, yeah, so that he's and, wanting a still man now. This so is, we, we, maybe this is a Derek question. Derek, you probably you probably I mean look, the bottom line is for me, if I were to if I were to try and come up with the best way, if I were to try and like somehow hold on to traditional, it would be a dating situation for me. Because if we could date them early, uh somehow we date the gospels being written before 
say 70 AD, uh, then we would be able to say, Hey, this makes a lot of sense that these are companions. These are people connected to them. And that's what the tradition has it as is that, you know, these are like for Luke, Luke was a companion to Paul. Paul's running around in the forties, fifties. How do we have that? We have guys like Steve Mason who just came on my channel and gave mm -hmm. great evidence for why it was written after Josephus's writings in 93. So it had to be later than that. Are we going to suggest that this guy was running around 50 years ago with Paul as a companion, which meant he was a grown man. And then he's this really old guy put in this literature together at like 70, 80 years of age at the least or later. So it would be dating. I would want to date mm -hmm. these as early as possible as a fundamentalist, ignore Steve Mason, ignore experts on the subject matter that actually date these things later and say, no, 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 no. You're, and you hear this a lot. No, no, no. You ridiculous uh, anti-believers that don't accept the fact that this is prophecy. You think these claims about the temple and this over detailed explanation is evidence that it's written after. No, no, no. This is evidence of divine uh, uh, proof that Jesus did predict it down to the minutia and all that kind of stuff. So I would maybe do that if I were coming from that worldview. Uh, there oh, there's my buddy. He can't hear me though. He can't. Can you say hi? Hi. Hey, buddy. Is that Derek? Huh? Yeah. Is that it Derek? is Derek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Dr. Kip. What's up, buddy? Okay. Can you say bye? Bye. Bye. You're hungry? Okay, we'll, we'll eat soon. Whoa. I love you. Go get mommy. I, I am also hungry. Okay, okay. I will in just a minute, okay? I love you like crazy. Dude, I got to come visit again. He, every time I'm there, man, he's awesome. He's. Yeah. By the way, and for those who don't know that Dr. Josh's house is a Garden of Eden, and there is no such thing as nakedness when you go to his house. Uh, his son runs around with his noodle flinging everywhere, man. <laughs> he doesn't give a hoot. It's so, it's so true. It is. It is it's absolutely so true. true, man. Converse contender. What is up, man? I haven't seen you in a long time. Is Dr. Josh a specialist in this field? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know exactly what he's what he's referring to. Obviously, uh, probably not the previous the previous question. No, but you know. yeah, no, no, certainly not in that. And I'm reticent to call myself a specialist, even in like a seriological things. And the reason that I am is because I'm not actively in academia, right? And as as frustrating as that is to me and to Megan, um, I feel like in order to carry that title specialist, at least for me and for me to feel comfortable saying it, I'd I'd want to be working in the field every day. Yeah. Right. Doing and, and so um yeah, and that so also I mean, it's like a constant peer review type thing. You know what I mean? To be constantly active with your with your fellow peers that are peer reviewing work that's being that kind of stuff, right? Sure. I mean, like, okay, if if you if somebody wants to like, if Ori got by came up and said, let's have a conversation about another graphic MSL text from Kish. Like, yes, I'm. A, I feel like I'm a specialist in that, right? I'm a specialist in MSL. I'm a specialist in some certain it's definitely in like literary aspects of Sumerian or something, but I mean like, no, even, even then, because I'm not working in it all the time, I just, I don't feel comfortable referring to myself as a specialist. And that's like, this is really the key in my online presence. Like this explains, I think very well why I'm here doing what I do because my job is not to say, listen to me. My job is to say, these are the people that you want to listen to. How do I know that? Because I have a research, I have a terminal degree and I know how to do research. And uh, in these particular areas where I have specialization, that's the person you want to listen to. That one right there, that one right there. This is what consensus scholarship is. This is what the supermajority says about this. These are the people that you want to refer to. And let me turn you to them. That's, I'm a liaison. I'm a liaison. So, mm. yeah. Well put. Thank maybe, you, maybe I'll, just, uh, I'll say something too about specialization um, and something that that maybe people are are not aware of. But like uh, we, Josh and I have talked about this in the past too. Um, you know, I I have uh, I don't know 10, 12 years of, of training in in Hebrew. I think like three years of of 
of training in, in Greek, uh, uh, a couple of years in, in, in Syriac, a couple of years in Aramaic. And even though Hebrew is my strongest, and even though I've had multiple years, you know, working with all of these languages, I would, I would never, ever uh, consider myself an expert at, at any of them. Uh, just no, because there, I mean, there are people out there. Um, you know, I have, I have, I have friends and colleagues. One of my mentors have dedicated their entire lives yeah. Yeah. to things like Hebrew syntax. Yeah. Right. So it's just, yeah. And to put this in perspective, last night, Kip and I were texting back and forth. <laughs> I snapped a picture of this paleo Hebrew inscription and we're like, we're because somebody asked Megan, Megan's got this Etsy shop where she makes cool stuff like this. Oh yeah, that's right. Which is I need to put that in the description. Yeah, so yeah. we need to plug that so people can get them. They can order stuff. But but somebody uh, somebody sent uh, commissioned her to do uh, this Paleo Hebrew inscription. So I just I saw it on the counter and I said, Oh man, what is this? And she said, Oh, you know, William Reed, Doctor William Reed, um, uh, you know, sent it over. So I snapped a picture of it and sent it over to Doctor Kip and then started looking at it and uh and i said i i i don't know i don't no, know what I this asked is you, i asked you what it was i said what is oh that? right and so i started trying to read it proverbs right well that's, i asked megan what, <laughs> what like, she thought she I'm said looking at it I'm she like, said i think william proverbs. said it's from proverbs so then i looked at the first line <laughs> okay. and what did it say it was like um may the, uh, with, may the house be wisdom, built in wisdom or something yeah it's wisdom it but, will be built uh, yeah but we're sitting so, here reading this thing line by line <laughs> on the fly in paleo hebrew right so like kip yeah, knows and it's, this stuff not well no <laughs> the i mean the, but i mean it's the paleo hebrew the, so it's like a but yeah it's it's something that both of us are kind of like like stammering through <laughs> Um, as soon as you taking, can, as soon as you can get it into, in your head, into the Aramaic block script, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. I know what this says. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. Exactly. But it's like, what? I got to remember, what is that with the curve? Just as a side note here, I just realized that Converse is playing off of, he's joking. He's He's got to be playing off of me saying all the time, ah, I'm not a specialist in this. Oh, I don't have an expertise. <laughs> that has to be what that means. So I have that's completely great. flummoxed. Is and mess this up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, take things William. Too serious. <laughs> oh man, awesome, awesome. Stop scamming, man. Any updates on the Citizen Science Initiative to translate ancient dig digitized text through masses of volunteers? I don't know anything about that. I don't either. I mean, there's definitely digital. Yeah, like I worked on a digital humanities project for uh, Dr. Jake Lowinger, where we were looking at the Alalok texts. Uh, Akkadian text, and I, I was working on tagging them and limitizing them to uh, to bring them over uh, for a search engine. Um, and, you know, of course, the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature is one of these digital uh, things. I put together a long-ass Word document of all the Sumerian liturgical texts. Um, and they're not limitized or anything, but they're there, so they're searchable. Um by the way, Kip, peep, there's somebody in the chat. I keep oh, seeing Hebrew pop up asking you. Uh, so, Afro Lamedit, where did where did you study? Um, there was another one. I thought I saw somebody writing in Hebrew. Yeah. Um, well, I can't find the other one now. Damn it! Sorry, this chat moves pretty quickly. It sure does. I um, yeah, I haven't been paying that close attention. Am I like way behind? <clears throat> I, don't, just I don't. I'm just scrolling up looking for Hebrew, I so that too. I can. Oh, well, I I know I had uh, noticed one there. Like I had. Oh, there we go. Um, you know, uh, where did where did you learn Hebrew? Um, I studied at. Uh, I, I started studying in my undergrad at trinity western university which is just down the road from me here and i also studied hebrew at the university of manchester where i was awarded my phd 
I got another super chat, and that's the last one. And welcome in here, Jonathan McClatchy, and everyone in the chat. I mean, uh, I haven't paid Jonathan attention McClatchy. to everybody. Yeah. Nice. He wrote that uh, so. that good critical uh, review of uh, the book I have. I got a new bookshelf, by the way. It's blurry. Oh it's yeah, blurry. no, it's a it's an excellent it's, review that he wrote yeah. of um, of J W Wallace, the world's most credulous cold case detective. <laughs> um, and his uh, his most recent book, Person of Interest, which which sure looks like it's god awful. But uh, thank you, I've... Jonathan McClatchy, for reading that book, so nobody else has to. I found the the it says uh, very very. So uh, do do you speak Hebrew? Um, I, it's directed at you. I need to learn yeah uh, okay. i don't speak it well at all yeah like it's oh, been years I, you know i and i i'm honestly i mean those are the sorts of things where <clears throat> you know unless you're i haven't spent nearly enough time in israel um which is which is really where people uh people in our field at least unless you know the you you grew up in synagogue um you go to israel uh, to study and to learn Hebrew. And I never did. Um, I can, you know, I can read journal articles uh, very slowly <laughs> that are written in modern Hebrew. Um, and, you know, when I was, when I was cooped up in the, uh, in the hotel room with Dr. Peter Flint every night, uh, watching, watching television and watching him skip through all 15 channels every every 30 seconds you know i could uh i i could i could follow the uh the subtitles or sorry no i mm -hmm. yeah i could i could follow the subtitles on the screen pretty good so but that's, yeah, that's funny. it's it's funny just a, a very quick story so when i started seminary um like i i <clears throat> you didn't have to take hebrew into your second year i think or maybe your second semester but i I got to jump on it because I wanted to be really good at it. So I started, I bought all these grammars and started, uh. you know, studying on my own. And it was so frustrating because I remember reading through, uh, was it Alan Ross's grammar? And it was just like, who is this written for? Like, you have to know Hebrew to use this thing. So I came across this website. It was called Hebrew World, HebrewWorld.com. And it was run by a guy that was, uh, he was the head of the department, I think, out at Arizona State. And Danny Bengigi was his name. And so I, I called him because his number was there. And I said, you know, I've been told by my professors that modern Hebrew and biblical Hebrew are just so different that it would be bad to learn modern Hebrew. And he said, yeah, we have a word for that in Hebrew, and it's baloney. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, they do the same thing as Greek, too. So, That's awesome. yeah. so I, I learned modern Hebrew. I mean, I, like I learned it i'm always you know i want to be very precise about that i learned mm -hmm. to to you know uh read a lot and speak a fair amount of conversational hebrew before i waded into um you oh. know the intricacies of of biblical hebrew and i can tell you from experience even though there are obvious differences between them and forms of stuff if you know modern hebrew it is a whole hell of a lot easier to learn biblical hebrew so no oh, yeah 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 anyway. well last super I, chat I, I guys just, I, okay sorry i just want to get it and then if you guys want to you can right. uh mjt532 was daniel 7 which clearly describes antiochus written second century bc if it was written earlier is the aramaic and daniel 7 too late i don't know um i haven't looked closely at the aramaic um like from, this is uh, a good question. A yeah, this is a good question for Jim. Probably, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think that I think that uh, generally speaking, um, like the Aramaic is not the Aramaic of Daniel is not something that is incredibly diagnostic as far as uh, trying to narrow it down to more than you know within these three centuries or something. Yeah. It's not like it really. Yeah, I'm, it's not yeah. like it. Uh, it's the Hebrew, I think that. Um, yeah, my my sense has been that the that the linguistic arguments from the Aramaic are ones that that 
tend to be that don't tend to be be forwarded much from scholars. Yeah, um, I mean they're they're not. But it definitely. It, yeah, I would. I was going to say though, Daniel seven. Yes, definitely. You know, I think we can we can say it was was written in the second century. Yeah. So is that is that your wife in the chat, Josh? I mean, is this not is me. this you? Oh, okay. Nope. It is. Oh, right. <laughs> I should have just <laughs> read says, the it's damn Megan message. Is... <laughs> hey, it's me, Megan. Uh, hello, Megan. Uh, she might be coming in to say everybody's very hungry. I'm not sure. Yeah. Hey, hey Josh. <laughs> hey, man. Right. But no, go to her Etsy shop. Like, I'm, I'm going to hold Give it up here. Oh, this is, yeah. Yeah. Where's this, this link is at? this is Cedar. And she, that's Gilgamesh. And these on, are two on. lines from Gilgamesh and Huawa A. They're my favorite two lines in all of Sumerian literature. Um, oh, and the translation's on there too. So yeah, that's anyway. awesome, dude. I gotta get but something on my this. desk behind me. Actually, uh, gotta get. I gotta order one so that I have something. Maybe we'll that. send you this one. You know, as well, free well, advertising. <laughs> you don't have to. You know me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, seriously, where's the link to that though? I'm not I'm not uh Megan, if you're listening, can you put the link? Yes, please in the put it in chat? the chat. You are able to do that because you're a moderator. Uh your YouTube channel's a moderator, so but yeah, I want to put that in there now. <laughs> Sorry, look, Converse Contender actually texted he actually texted me to say that was a joke, Josh. <laughs> 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 Sorry, William, man. That is totally my fault. A hundred percent my fault. <laughs> oh man. He, he's very he's very patient with me. <laughs> right. Dude, Everybody was, is. You know, if I'd have read like 10 like chats down, I'd have seen him saying, I'm joking. I didn't even read it. Okay, here it is. Here is the link in the chat. Go now. Cuneo wow. formations. Cuneo it formations. Is awesome. You know, you can have a t you can have something made. And have Sumerian salvation. You could have all that put on there for you. you know? Well, the, the nice thing about it is when I say that she was commissioned, William Reed, Dr. William Reed, who went to Hopkins with us, who's a Hebrew Bible, he's a Hebrew Bible specialist. Um, he had this inscription that I don't know if he drew it by hand or what. I, I assume that he did, but it was in vector format, you know, vector, uh, whatever, yeah. graphic, I guess. And, uh, just send it to her and she can put it into the computer and then print it essentially in laser. The laser will cut, you know, in, inscribe it. Uh, so what, like if you have something that you want, like email her about it. Cause she can, uh, she can probably just make it. I'm adding so. this into the description of this. Uh, so that, this that paleo Hebrew inscription was for, uh, for Dr. Reed. Yep. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Wow. That is awesome. I'm give me just a second. I don't even want to wait uh, for, <laughs> for just because we're live on the channel making it happen. Um, seriously, that's going to be the first link. So if you guys are interested, it is uh, the cuneiform. Uh, let me say cuneiform. while you're doing that, I'm going to tell a funny story. Just so when I lived out in Winchester, Virginia, uh, there was this little mall and they had, you know, calling it a mall, I think is making it sound bigger, much bigger than it was. Um, and they had these kiosks in, you know, in the walkway. And uh, one of the kiosks was Dead Sea Salt, you know, the Dead Sea Salt, salt kiosks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there were these yeah, two individuals uh, from, from Israel that were there selling it. And, you know, I'm a 6'2", goofy looking white guy, right? You know, and uh, I'm walking through this, sort of country area and as i walked i'd been studying hebrew for a while right so as i walked by they said oh would you like to try some and i mean without really even turning much i said lo to die and they must be kesef right no thank you i don't have enough money <laughs> and there was this <laughs> <laughs> it was like, really funny. What? Uh, I see that it was there's, so a, funny. there's a guy who speaks all sorts of languages well, on YouTube. He's so, got a viral channel that does that as well. Like, yeah, go and speak Chinese. And like, it was funny. I love to die. That's because, and they must I, be guessing. I have to. I have to tell. I have to tell uh, a story now. Um, 
when I was the first time I was in Israel, um, was uh, when I was working on the uh, the Isaiah Scroll with uh, Dr. Peter Flint and Gene Ulrich, and it was also um, at the same time as the uh, uh, the annual Orion Conference on the Dead Sea Scrolls that's put on by the Hebrew University, and uh, so you know I was we were kind of splitting our time between the museum and that. And I, you know, I was a new PhD student. I hadn't even really started my program yet. I had just been accepted. Um, and so I didn't really know a lot of people. But one person I did know was, uh, was Roy Brown, who was the founder of uh, Accordance Bible Software, which is the, uh, the Mac version uh, Bible software that is amazing. Um, so I knew him through, through one of my mentors, uh, Marty Abeg, and I kind of, as soon as I saw him, I walked up to him, I'm like, Roy, it's really good to see you because, you know, I don't know anybody else here. Um, and he kind of looks really uncomfortable and he looks at me and he, he kind of goes, hi, sort of thing. Right. And then, <laughs> and then like, um, he looks around and, uh, and Roy's just kind of a really interesting eccentric sort of guy so he looks around and then he kind of pulls me aside and he says to me you know sort of quietly he's like you'll have to forgive me if i don't talk to you tonight because when i'm in israel i like to i like to talk to people in hebrew and well because you don't know hebrew i i can't really take the time out to talk to you at all so just you know just like that and the rest of the night like every now and then he'd like come by me and he'd be like yeah i can't talk to you because you know hebrew yeah. so and i don't know if he was if he was joking or if he was serious but it was whether <laughs> he funny. was or wasn't it was like the it was the best it was the best conference troll i think i've ever i've i've ever been party to so yeah <laughs> Oh, well, well, if I may, if I may, yeah. as we're leaving, I want to do this again with you guys for real. This has been a blast. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, please do me a favor. Go subscribe to Dr. Kip Davis' YouTube channel. He's got a ton of stuff. Uh, he's continuing to produce, and uh, you've been showing up on a lot of other people's channels a lot too. So you're getting your name out there. Uh, there's a lot you know you're trying to do. You guys are coming together here soon on publishing something against inspiring philosophies version if you will of uh the genesis narratives and and the problems with his approach to the intertextuality and such as he's kind of cherry picking these scholars you guys are going to take a deep there's, dive so yeah there's so much in there it's actually going to be two videos so yeah. Mm. yeah how long do you know yet well the first one the first one what did i say josh uh 40 minutes yeah i think so 40 45 and, yeah. and real quick, jo so, and, Jojo Freelancer, you're, I've already answered your question at the beginning of the video, so you must have missed it. Uh, you've been repeating the same question. We already answered this, so you're going to have to watch the live again at the beginning. To to Now, they don't, they never heard anything like that. It, was, so. it wasn't a good answer. It was, it yeah, was I'm just a, saying, they don't uh, know anything about your the Arabia, <laughs> the idea of the Bible coming from the Arabia. Um, also, Digital Hammurabi. You know, he's been around for a while, all scholarship, of course. They interview other scholars as well as activities of uh, helping people who are trying to go and get an education. You guys do scholarships for people and academic mm -hmm. things like that. So, like, I'm a big fan of what you do. And you have interviewed someone that I hope to interview when their book is released. And that is Francesca Stravagapulu. You I'm will. Saying, you will. Yeah, I'm looking forward to her and her book, God and Anatomy. Um, I, I can't order it unless I order it through like a, a place that'll get it in another country and then mail it to me. But come January, she's promised me in emails that we're going to make it happen here on myth vision. So they have all that. Yeah, like if you awesome. want to see those interviews, dude, subscribe to their channel, Joel Baden. This is where I really got introduced to Joel was through Dr. Josh. A lot of the scholars, Dr. Josh has interviewed. I've been trying to piggyback off of him. Um, I, every, every time I, I, like I tweeted, uh, he's been going through, if you don't follow him on Twitter, go follow him on Twitter. You need to. He's been going through uh, the Pentateuch, just you know, section of verses at a time. And uh, he's he's just, he's made it into Leviticus 25. And so he's taken like the first three sections of Leviticus 25. And I know that there are tons of people online that are on the edge of their seat 
waiting for him to get to versus 44 to 46, right? Yeah. And uh, so I commented on it to, to, to try to say, you know, to put it out there again, you guys need to submit. I said, is anybody else on the edge of their seat waiting for him to get to this? And <laughs> like it's, I think it sounded like, hurry up. <laughs> that's, that's definitely not how I meant it. I followed it up, you know, obviously with, you know, if you're not following him, I don't know what you're doing with your life because this is an amazing series. And he was like, well, I'm going to slow down now. I was like, oh. <laughs> I always feel like I put my foot in my mouth with him anytime I interact with yeah. him. He's so awesome. Jill Bain is awesome. Raphael, I already have my friend. She she wrote me back, so I'm hoping that we can make it happen. But yeah, go subscribe to his Digital Hammurabi as well as Dr. Kip. Get the books. Um, he's got four different books. You guys can get old the atheist handbooks of the Old Testament, which is a good weapon. I always say, you know, you gotta. <laughs> you guys need a weapon to like beat someone up or a door stopper in case you you know, get through with it and you don't get the book. It's definitely worth having. Thank and you. there's a lot of great stuff. If you don't read paperback, you got it on audible. You've been doing that really good with your, with your, uh, and you have Seth reading it, of course, yeah, uh, yeah. learn to read ancient Sumerian did the old Testament endorse slavery. And when we say slavery, we say slavery yeah. and then learning to pray in a dead language, of course, getting into the Sumerian language. And you talk about some of this in some of the episodes I've interviewed on the, Mm -hmm. patron uh so go to the gift shop of course i just posted mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. in the description you, this is really i mean this is cool it's i gotta amazing. get one it's of cool stuff. it's just amazing so Dang. i want some cool christmas stuff. ornaments i think um those oh, are puzzles uh, the ornaments that, that that no well the jit no sorry the, the ornaments yeah they're, they're made These of cedar are, i think oh, yeah. or i think you, but this yeah. one right this, I'm pointing oh, no. I'm pointing oh, at the no. screen like you can see where I'm pointing. Yeah, I'm like, what the hell are you pointing at? <laughs> the laser cut jigsaw puzzle is a, is the cuneiform tablet that's a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. It's two sided, so you can flip it over. So awesome. And there's the back of the tablet, but it means that every puzzle piece has um markings on both sides. Yeah. So oh, it's wow. even more tricky. It's really it's like, cool though. It's like putting together a codex fragment. Yes, that's, that's awesome. exactly what it's right. It's exactly totally. what it's like. Totally. So, hey, it's Derek, I just I wanted I wanted to mention um, if anybody is interested in in reading any of my books, please don't buy them because I don't get any money for them. They're way too expensive, <laughs> and do whatever you can to pirate them for free on the internet. Okay, they're out there. It's interesting because. The Old Testament endorsed slavery and the atheist handbook to the Old Testament are now pirated. Uh, like that, that somebody, somebody, but you know what? I'm okay with it. Um, I think actually our Sumerian grammar has been pirated for a while. The thing is, I think so. We do make money from our books because we self publish them. Yeah, um, so don't do that, to Dr. Josh. But I think uh, like people, people do like having physical copies. So hopefully they'll keep buying them anyway. Yeah, I think that this is an inside jab that Dr. Kip is really trying to do. I feel like you have some, <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing a joke here. Uh, <laughs> you have to, be. Uh, I'm, have I'm to. dead serious. Uh, well, I'm not saying find, that they shouldn't you go read find my, my stuff for free out there, please download it. And last oh. of all, if you aren't a patron, please consider becoming one. Uh, just this video right here is specifically in response to our dear friend, Otangelo. <laughs> Otangelo, Dr. Is Andrew Casper is in Ohio. He is at The Ohio State University. He has written uh, a wonderful book, uh, An Artful Relic, and delves into the church history behind relics and their, their meaning and I uh, hope you see this. If not, someone who might be a friend of him can send this to him to see at the uh, end of this video. I this will make sure he is, he shows up in a lot of streams where I troll. So um, I will make sure that I, I I get that out. I'll try to publish this over the next few days. Uh, this will be on YouTube public. But this is an example of early examples. I launched this stuff onto my Patreon early. And a lot of this stuff hasn't made it to YouTube world. 
Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that I have that doesn't. And private conversations, you guys can message me. I interview a lot of the scholars in person, including you, Dr. Josh. Eventually, Kip, we'll be meeting as well at some point, I'm sure. And I want to be able to ask the questions of the Patreon members who help. You will look back at this one day, especially the older academics that may not be around for too long. And you'll say, look at this video. That was my question. And I got to ask that man and I made history or that woman and we made history. And in 50, 60 years, that could be saved for your grandchildren's children, whoever. Um, that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do is um, yes, it keeps Smith vision alive for doing this, but also people feel like they're part of something when they get to involve themselves with the academics that I've been so privileged and op- having the opportunity to go sit at their feet and stuff. So that's my final ra- uh, rant. Could, could I plug one person, yeah. scholar, scholar vid in the side chat has some really cool. It's a smaller channel, uh, but right. has some has some really cool videos up, some really cool interviews. So I think he just had a Francesca Sabracopoulou. He had one up. But anyway, it's a uh, it's worth checking out. Definitely. Um, that wasn't supposed to be awesome. talked on on the Internet Scholar. We'll talk afterwards about this. So um, thanks a lot for the uh, <laughs> comment there now seriously uh go check everyone out all that's down in the description and uh until le- next time ladies and gentlemen never forget we are myth vision <laughs>